I, I need to introduce somebody for a moment. Of course, all those stones happen to be thrown in occupied territory. <laughs> uh, in our own land. But, uh, and we're going to have to talk a lot more about what you can do in the next panel. We're already doing this, which is great. Yes. <laughs> but uh, we have a special guest here I want to introduce because he had to leave at 11 o'clock. Donald Pegler is one of the survivors of the assault on the USS Liberty in the Mediterranean in June, 50 years ago this June. Let him say a word about it. A U.S. ship assaulted by the Israelis that killed, what, 34? Yeah, to, to do a quick overview, 70% uh, of our crew were killed or wounded. Um, we were under attack about as long as Pearl Harbor. When the Israeli aircraft left, we had over 820 rocket and cannon holes in the top side of the ship, not to mention over 3,000 machine gun hits. Then they came out with bombers and dropped napalm on us. And while we were trying to fight the fires from the napalm, they brought out three Navy torpedo boats and fired five torpedoes at us. Uh, we took one 40-foot torpedo hole in the starboard side of the ship. Uh, I won't go into my story, although I talked a little, a little about it. Um, and uh, when I was debriefed afterwards, I was told, you've got the highest security clearance anybody can get in this country. Go away, never talk about this to anybody including your family, and for 20 years I kept it all bottled up inside, and that's another whole story in and of itself. Uh, but it was similar to what everybody's been talking about. It's the organized way of keeping anything like this buried. Um, I ended up having to do uh, 20, uh, three years in post-traumatic stress disorder therapy. Um, unfortunately, I lost my wife almost five years ago, and I'm now in a, in a, in a, a depression a, a group up at the VA at Long Beach, uh, mostly because of that, but it brought back all my PTSD from the Liberty. So anyway, I, I've got to go, and I don't want to take up any more time. Uh, Thank, you, Thank you for being here. Thank you. Well. Another grave injustice buried. There's one topic that I expected to be addressed here and about, you know, the hope for the Palestinian family. And I haven't see, seen it at all, and I don't see it in this. I see somebody as an educator and distress it. I mean, if you're talking about hope, you're going to be talking about education and the chance of people getting better, better work and, and better knowledge and also be able to act themselves as advocates as one of the possibilities. I mean, I know in history the Palestinians have one of the highest rates of literacy and of, uh, also of a college uh, enrollment in the uh, Arab world. I don't think that's gone up any, it's probably gone down. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd sort of like to hear this discussed because there's a lot of way for Palestinians, you know, they may become construction workers. They may integrate into Israel society as the low, you know, in the in the lo lower uh, uh, remunerated trades without any education. And that's, basically, you know, the Israelis would basically be happy for that if they weren't throwing rocks. They would, and they do. They, you know, they do a lot of work in construction, and they do a lot of work uh, in, you know, uh, domestic employment and and such. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering what the future is to try to promote uh, education, both in Gaza, in is the Israel yeah. among Israeli Arabs, and in the West Bank. Thank you for that question. I remember UNICEF did a report on this very issue in, I think it was 1982. And uh, Edward Said and Ibrahim Abalugo and others published it in a booklet and the Palestinians had the highest education rate across the Middle East in 1982, and a higher PhD rate per capita than Israel itself had. That's gone down, and it's intentional. So I'd like to hear from. So, 
Um, you know, being from Gaza, you're correct that that is, they still have the highest literacy rate for men and women, you know, compared to other Arab countries. But people in Gaza can't go anywhere, so they go to, they go to school. So, for example, my cousin's daughter graduated. She got the highest mark, so she's going to go to medical school. Where? The only place she can go, which is in Gaza City. What's the quality of education she's going to get? What kind of jobs will be available to her afterwards? They're not allowed to go travel to work in Israel, the people from Gaza. They used to be, and they would take any job. And I have cousins and relatives who could speak fluent Hebrew, would work in restaurants, and that's how they do it. But Gaza doesn't have any opportunity except what's in Gaza. And people who even get scholarships to come out, we've heard stories where they're prevented. In the West Bank, it's true. Palestinians are the ones building the wall. They built the settlements. They are the construction workers. They will take the jobs if they have the jobs. So as far as education as a way to get out, that's what they want to do. And there's some reports that even now, if there are educated professionals in the West Bank, Israel's recruiting them if they need them to fill the gaps in the areas that are populated by Palestinians, especially living in Israel. So there is that intention, that energy, that desire. But there's only so much people can do under the circumstances of this kind of suppression. Last thing I'll say about education in Lebanon, for example, for Palestinians living in the refugee camps. They have a very dismal condition. Among the people, say, in the camps that are in Lebanon, 5% um, of them graduate from high school because they have such challenges. And of those 5%, even a fewer number are able to go on to college because the system discriminates against them. So it's not without some kind of desire or urge or will to want to improve. That is very strong, but it's the circumstances that make it very, very difficult. I think we have to, to keep that in mind. Uh, there's severe overcrowding in the schools in Gaza. They have to go in three shifts. So, and then, you know, in terms of the quality of the teachers, the materials that they use to educate, there's so many challenges, but yet they still put the high premium on education. At least I can speak on behalf of my family yes. and community in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Sony. I would recommend that you read this tome by Sarah Roy, who was the keynote speaker at our Sibiel conference about four years ago, I think it was. It's called The Gaza Strip, The Political Economy of Dedevelopment. If you don't want to get a full history of Gaza, all you really have to read is her introduction, which was written in 2014, or 2013 and 14, before the last onslaught. The people in Gaza have an economy which is totally dependent upon outside aid. They have no means of building their own infrastructure. Every time Israel bombs them, they destroy their infrastructure. I can't tell you how many businesses have been bombed to smithereens, along with the infrastructure of water, power, sanitation, schools, hospitals, mosques. The whole civilization is a target in Gaza. You cannot expect people who cannot have a productive economy with freedom to travel, with freedom to export their products, with freedom to grow food and feed their own people and to export it to the West Bank, which they cannot do right now. You cannot expect them to see education as the way out of their situation. The way out of the situation is for us to educate the fools that run this country to tell them to stop supporting Israel's expropriation, oppression, violence, and injustice. And when that happens, maybe people can start going to school and not have to go to a trauma center. Okay, we got time for one more. Who will it be? Ah, okay. Now, before you do, did you catch what Tony just said? Remember, how many remember Groucho Marx show? And the duck would drop down with a word for the day? What would the word be for the day that Tony just said? Justice. De development. Intentional destruction. Intentional de-development, deprivation, abuse, militarization. So liberation is the answer to that. Okay, last question. You have listened to everything about Israel from A to Z, and we have listened to all these situations from the past several times. And you have mentioned right now that 
Israel is in violation of international law, but nobody mentioned that America is in conspiracy of supporting violation of international law by having the states, 40 states, I don't know how many states, are stopping the BDS badly. Nobody can go against the First Amendment of the state. Now, the whole situation is going with our Congress that also are running a, a, a bill right now. They want to also to stop the BDS to continue. The BDS is, a viol is, is to stop Israel from violating international law. But the United States says, no, you cannot stop Israel from doing whatever they want. It's, it's anti-Semitic. We have the Jewish Voice for Peace. They are Jewish. They're not anti-Semitic. They are supporting the Palestinians. What can we do to stop our criminal United States justice to stop the, the uh, citizens of this country to do whatever they want according to the First Amendment? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Now, we're going to hit that one this afternoon a little bit harder. So don't go home. <laughs> Make sure you're here. But we'll, we'll add something to that right now. Very important point. Did everybody hear it? That our Congress is complicit in silencing the voices of resistance, which is many of us. And one of the key issues is boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And how do we preserve that? And the answer is resistance. We're going to get into that. But Tom, say a word, and then we're going to have to end this session. Can I say one question? Of course. So Don, I think, I think you said it, that several, several speakers have used the words, the term BDS. And that's shorthand for the boycott efforts, divestment of our holdings in companies that profit from and sustain the military occupation, boycott, divestment, and governmental sanctions, S, sanctions, advocating for governmental sanctions from the United States to stop financing and supporting the military occupation. So BDS is the shorthand for that large and burgeoning effort. Yes. I just, I Layla. Just, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Interesting because I remember when the Second Intifada started in 2002, speaking to this notion of nonviolent resistance. And we met with a group, it was an interfaith gathering that really wanted to support the Palestinians. And this was after the Palestinians had resorted to violence after their nonviolent demonstration. They got shot at, and that's when uh, Hanan Ashrawi took the bullet to her leg. And they said, you know, it would be so much easier to support you if you would engage in nonviolent resistance yeah. instead of violent resistance. And so, you know, there was the, then the years of, of the terrible actions in terms of suicide bombings and so forth happened and, and finally stopped. And Palestinians, uh, m many of whom never supported that, were always engaged in some form of nonviolent resistance. It's when it finally started to actually have some teeth, if you will, in this BDS movement that now this feeling is, no, you can't even do nonviolent resistance because that is our nonviolent resistance. Yeah. It is something that has worked under, for apartheid South Africa and other settings where it says, this is the path we're taking. We don't believe in violence as a, resolu as a way to resolve our situation. But then the feeling is that, well, once that seemed to have some kind of impact, the reaction again is so tremendously disproportionate that it wants to eliminate free speech for people living in this country among 40 states or more. So it's, we can never quite win, even when we're trying to do things in the way that could be supported by certain, or certain groups, as long as, and the way I put it as a Palestinian American, is that now we have to you know, relinquish our desire for returning to our homeland and then be grateful for being given the opportunity to say, take it, and it's yours. And so it's that we're never doing enough to be able to, to claim. But this is really a very, very important issue, and I think we'll, we'll talk about it. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Very quickly, the S, uh, uh, the S stands for sanctions. And I see that Dick Platkin is here from uh, LA Jews for Peace. And Dick and I have been very much in accord for a number of years now that the S in the standing for sanctions is not paid enough attention to by the whole movement. We've got the Arms Export Control Act, we've got the Leahy Amendment. We should not be shipping arms over to Israel 
because the Leahy Amendment and the Arms Export Control Act specifically say that the armaments to other countries will not be used against civilians. Case closed. And you can talk to your Congress people about that as well. Okay. I think our panel has done a great job of stirring us up. Thank you.